it is my pleasure to introduce two-time Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees David Crosby, Stephen Stills, and Graham Nash. December 2015, Crosby, Stills and Nash performed Silent Night at the National Christmas Tree Lighting in Washington, where the whole event is live streamed. Before the song even begins, the group display volatile anger towards each other. An intro had been pre-written for them on cue cards, but when David Crosby begins reading Stephen Stills' part, Stills throws his guitar pick at Crosby. Crosby continues to read Stills' part before Graham Nash finishes the speech. Before the song begins, Stills snaps, I can't believe you. I can't believe you. For two and a half minutes, the three sing an off-key rendition of Silent Night to an unimpressed audience. Stills later said he couldn't hear himself, hence being unable to harmonise. This will be the last time CSN perform together. Backstage afterwards, Stills and Crosby begin arguing. Stills is angry that Crosby had read his lines, and Crosby is angered Stills was singing off-key. The pair then lunge at each other before being broken apart. Side note, this documentary will now continue from where the hard times of Neil Young and CSNY ended. The previous documentary covers the band's early years up until 1976. By 1978, Stephen Stills, influenced by the sound of the time, had recorded a disco album. It became his first solo record to not even break the top 40. Neil Young had set out on his lengthy Russ Never Sleeps tour, while Crosby and Nash had joined forces again to release their own records. David Crosby's addictions by this point were out of control. He carried around a glass pipe which he used to free bass. Crosby was no stranger to using hard drugs while making music. He'd never played live sober and prided himself on his drug use never compromising his music. Like many functioning addicts, Crosby was able to juggle his career and his addictions. This is until now. While recording in Britannia Studios in LA, Crosby leaves his pipe on an amp. The vibrations slowly shake the pipe off the amp where it smashes to the floor. Crosby falls to the floor and begins trying to piece it back together. At this point, Nash leaves the studio. And at that moment, I knew that David was in deep trouble and that if David was in deep trouble, we were all in deep trouble. When he stopped that jam from going forward, a door shut in my mind. At this point, Nash leaves the studio. Furious Crosby storms out of the studio, drives off and crashes into a parked car. Nash would later use these songs to record his own album, Earth and Sky, which would be released two years later. In 1979, Crosby, Stills and Nash joined together to perform five concerts to raise funds for the anti-nuclear movement. Neil Young was never asked to be involved. He later stated that he didn't oppose nuclear power. Crosby was high the whole time and at one point was found cooking free bass in a backstage shower. When the shows finished, CSM parted ways again. This time, Crosby's drug abuse had drove them apart. At this time, Stills had met and began writing music with Michael Sturgis, a guitarist and former trumpet player. Excited, Stills contacted Nash and told him Sturgis was the new David Crosby. By 1980, Stills and Nash began recording tracks for a new album. The title track, Daylight Again, was a rewrite of Stills' previous song, Find the Cost of Freedom. Crosby was hurt he'd been left out by the two and without Crosby, Atlantic Records had no interest in the album. Stills and Nash were forced to pay for the sessions out of their own pocket. Nash later stated, Stills came alive without the fear of whatever Crosby would say to him if he sang something wrong. Without that pressure, he becomes much more involved. Neil Young at this time, distracted by family problems, had little time for music. He did, however, release an album of old material. 
Crosby at this time was spiraling into drug addiction, while at the same time insisting he'd made some of his best music while high. He was currently trying to sell a script for a movie he wrote titled Push Play. The story followed a supergroup whose guitarist dies and leaves behind a tape of songs to be recorded by the band. Crosby had hoped to play the dead musician. He was also looking to record a follow-up to his debut solo album, If I Could Only Remember My Name. Crosby had recorded the album back in 1971 and though intoxicated, he was still functioning. By this point, he was struggling. He spent hours freebasing in vocal booths. Following the assassination of John Lennon that year, Crosby begins carrying around a gun with him everywhere he goes. Meanwhile, with Atlantic refusing the Stills Nash album, the two were forced to contact Crosby and ask him to be part of the album. Crosby travelled to them but had to check into a hotel under a different name due to his reputation. He snuck into the hotel, began freebasing and burnt a hole in the mattress. In the studio, Crosby met his would-be replacement Michael Sturgis. Sturgis later said, I was there in case he died on the road. David didn't like it at all. During recording, Crosby struggled to stay focused and took constant bathroom breaks. He struggled to pull it together. Getting the three together for a photo shoot would prove impossible, so the cover featured three hovering flying saucers. In June 1982, Daylight Again was released. A few months later, a music video was shot for the single Southern Cross. It begins with stills at the helm of a large sailboat before showing the three stood in the dark, perhaps to both disguise Crosby's appearance and to hide how aged the three now looked. CSN embarked on a tour for Daylight Again. Crosby appeared high on stage in long sleeve flannel shirts, sung few lead vocals and barely spoke to the audience like he once had. This footage shows Crosby in a shocking state of intoxication. Crosby over the next few years was arrested multiple times. At one point while driving he had what was described as a cocaine seizure, crashed the car and was subsequently arrested when drugs were found in his possession. By 1983 Neil Young's album Trans was released. It alienated long-time fans while not bringing in new listeners. Young at this time had cut his hair short and dropped weight. Those close to Young said he was keeping away from CSN due to Crosby's addictions. At this time, Daylight again went platinum, selling a million copies. At this time, Young offered to let Crosby stay at his ranch in order to detox. Young also promised another CSN Y album if Crosby was to get clean. He refused. A few months later, Crosby was convicted on weapons and drugs charges. He was sentenced to five years in prison but released on bail. At this time, Neil Young released a rockabilly album titled Everybody's Rockin'. He later stated it was despite his record label Geffen, who had been so displeased with trans that demanded a rock and roll record. Everybody's Rockin' received the worst reviews of any Young album to date. Geffen sued Young on the grounds he was deliberately sabotaging his own work and it wasn't commercial. Young countersued, alleging breach of contract since he had been promised no creative interference from the label. Label owner David Geffen personally apologised to Young for the suit and for interference with his work. Crosby at this time checked himself into a psychiatric unit. He didn't stay long and at this time, Graham Nash quit using cocaine. Crosby was again in trouble over drug possession in 1984 and was offered an ultimatum by a judge, go into treatment or face jail time. Crosby agreed to go into treatment and checked himself into a facility in New Jersey where Papa John Phillips had previously checked in. Crosby was upset when he was not allowed to bring a guitar and attempted to smuggle drugs in. Seven weeks into the program, he escaped. Not long after, CSN and Young reunited to perform at Live Aid. CSN performed first in the morning. The performance began with Southern Cross, with the camera focusing on Stills and Nash. For the third song, Stills took Crosby's guitar from him and the group changed positions. Later that night, CSN Y took the stage. Neil later commented, You'd have thought our performance on Live Aid 
would have been enough to finish any wave of nostalgia. By late 1985, a judge ordered Crosby's arrest. Crosby sold his piano and fled from his house. As a fugitive, he hid out in various stars' homes. He headed to his boat, which was now a wreck. Broken, depressed, Crosby gave himself up and requested he be sent back to the rehab facility in New Jersey. The judge denied his request and handed him a prison sentence. While Crosby was incarcerated, Nash revived his solo career, releasing the album Innocent Eyes. In jail, Crosby spoke daily with girlfriend Jan Dance. Dance, an addict herself, weighed no more than 90 pounds at this point and decided to check herself into rehab. Crosby arranged for flowers to be delivered weekly to the rehab centre. During his time incarcerated, Crosby announced he was starting a prison band. After serving nine months, a fresh-faced, short-haired Crosby was released. Crosby was now clean and immediately began performing live again. Towards the end of 1986, Neil Young assembled the original members of Buffalo Springfield. They rehearsed together at his house. That year, Crosby, Stills and Nash entered the studio to record a new album. Still early in his sobriety, Crosby was cranky. The others were careful not to use any substances in front of him. During a recording session, Stills and Crosby got into a blazing row and the rest of the sessions were cancelled. In 1987, Crosby married Jan Dance. They were now both clean and strong in their sobriety. At the wedding, non-alcoholic wine was served. It was later claimed Stephen Stills was drunk. At this time, Stephen Stills' alcohol use had become a problem. West 57 interviewed the group to tell the story of Crosby's comeback. The three had also been asked to be interviewed by 60 Minutes, but they felt West 57 would go easier on them. They didn't. The segment started as the comeback of David Crosby and ended as a band unable to get it together. When pushed, Nash stated that Stills never saw him or Crosby as equals and they were treated as backup singers. He also addressed Stills' alcoholism. David, having had the courage to go right to the edge of death and come back, hurts the band because Stephen doesn't like that, because it threatens him, because Stephen knows that he may have to do the same and Stephen doesn't know whether he can. I think he can. Nash later admitted he was consciously talking to Stills through the later aired interview. When the interviewer questions Stills about his drinking, Stills gets agitated. I mean, everybody says that, you know, everybody should quit drinking and everything. And I'm just, you know, I'm saying, no, man. You know, I really love fine wine and good scotch, and, and uh, that's the end of that. And your background, I mean, you aren't exactly known as a, as a teacher. I like right? to party, all right? Right. That's my, own, uh, that's my own thing to deal with, and I'm not going to do it publicly. And it's not their business? Or yours. Thank you. But, but I'm saying grammar or, or David. my ass, I said it's the end of the subject. Of this time period, Stills later said he poured himself into a bottle of whiskey for 10 years and missed the 80s. Following the interviews, the camera crew filmed the band rehearsing. They captured an irate Nash yelling at an intoxicated Stills. If you want to f***ing work, get your axe on. Unless you want to get it over with now, and I'll call my partner in and trash the f*** out of you. Now get your f***ing guitar on and stop cool. f***ing around. Okay. Nash was volatile and powerful himself. He could push them around when needed, he could yell and scream and speak the truth, and in their hearts, they knew he was right. During the argument, Crosby put his hand in front of the camera, but it was too late. They already had the footage. After this, the group agreed on one more segment for the show. The three got together singing in harmony as if nothing had happened. When Neil Young watched the interview, he stated, The thing that surprised me was that they even did the show. What kind of stupid move is that? With the next tour underway, Stills encouraged people to come see them now Crosby was awake. Not long after, Stills got married for the second time. Neil Young at this point made good on his promise to make another CSNY album if Crosby was to sober up. 18 years after Deja Vu had been released, their follow-up album would finally begin. 
Atlantic Records handed them a one million in advance for American Dream. Recording would take place at Neil Young's Broken Arrow Ranch. Neil had converted one of his barns into a studio and they began laying down tracks. While in the studio, Peacocks walked over some of the members' BMWs parked outside. Studio techs once had to wait for 16 cows to pass before continuing to the studio. At one point, Crosby had to wait for a peacock to stop squawking until he could finish his vocals. With its release, American Dream disappointed fans and critics alike. Many believe the group is saving their best material for solo projects. There may be some truth to this, with Neil Young's Rockin' in the Free World being written during this time. Neil dismissed questions about a tour with CSN, while Crosby began promoting his autobiography, Long Time Gone. CSNY would then play live in Oakland, but there would be no CSNY tour for American Dream. Stills and Young toured solo, while Crosby finally released his second solo album, Oh Yes I Can, in 1989. After that, CSM began work on their next album, Live It Up. The songs were forgettable and neither Stills or Crosby wanted their image on the cover. Stills stated, We made a vow not to use our pictures anymore. They ended up using an artist's drawing. Nash described it as a f***ing weird image. It showed three hot dogs on skewers on the moon with the earth being seen in the background. Nash requested a fourth hot dog on a stick floating away to represent Neil Young. It was released June of 1990. Three months later, Crosby, Stills and Nash appeared on MTV's new series, MTV Unplugged. Nash, by this point, had grown a mullet in an attempt to look youthful. To the duo, playing Unplugged was unlike any other gig, and though a great performance, it went largely unnoticed at the time and thereon afterwards. In the following months, Neil Young invited CSN to play Farm Aid. As 1991 began, the birds were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Crosby at the time was in a wheelchair due to a motorcycle crash which broke his leg. Side note, Crosby sued the manufacturer for over a million and used the money to pay off his debts. At this point he recovered enough to stand for brief periods but required a wheelchair to get about. Former Birds bandmate Chris Hillman pushed Crosby around before the show. Reportedly, Crosby was being so demanding, Hillman joked about pushing him down a flight of stairs. At the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Bird drummer Michael Clark was extremely drunk, having battled with alcoholism since the 60s. Crosby offered to help to get him clean, which he refused. Clark would die two years later from liver failure. At the time of his death, he was 47 years old. When the birds took the stage, Michael Clark was so drunk he was unable to play drums. The house drummer filled in for him, and he stood dancing, singing, and clapping along to a chaotic performance. Crosby later said the whole thing was awkward and there were no warm feelings between them. Two months later, CSNY performed together in San Francisco. According to others around, Crosby and Stills needed to tour because they were always broke. In September, a box set of CSN and CSNY songs was released. It contained studio versions, alternative takes, and unreleased material. During this time, Neil Young began recording Harvest Moon. In February of 1993, Neil Young performed a live acoustic set for MTV Unplugged. The whole affair was very tense. Young was later said to be displeased with the performance of his band. In August of 1994, CSM released their next album, After the Storm. At the same time, Neil Young released an album titled Sleeps With Angels. The title was a song written about the death of friend Kurt Cobain. Later in the year, CSM would play Woodstock 94. The duo dreaded the concert. They felt what made Woodstock legendary was something that could not be repeated. The only reason they'd agreed to play is an offer of $250,000. Ideas floated around for the performance. 
one being the three be brought out in wheelchairs to play off their veterans of Woodstock image. Nash loved the idea but Stills hated it. The idea was dropped. Crosby later said, It was awful. We were playing to a mosh pit. The audience were drunk, stoned, covered in mud. Crosby at this time was in a financial crisis. He had to sell his home due to over a million in tax bills. He was also suffering chronic stomach pain. When Crosby got so sick he had to see a doctor, he was diagnosed with liver failure due to hepatitis C. He was soon admitted to hospital where he lay dying waiting for a liver transplant. Nash visited him in hospital. Before he was taken away for replacement surgery, Nash stated, Don't you leave me with stills. While Crosby recovered following the surgery, Stills brought him fresh chicken soup. In January of 1995, Crosby did an interview with Good Morning America. In the interview, he spoke about his recent liver transplant. The interviewer probed him on the ethics of giving a liver to a former drug addict. Later, his wife Jan joined him, where Crosby spoke about their money troubles. Later that year, Neil Young as a solo artist was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In his acceptance speech, he thanked his mom, Crazy Horse and Kurt Cobain for inspiring him. Crosby, Stills and Nash were not mentioned. Two years later, Neil Young was again to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Buffalo Springfield. CSM were also to be inducted that night. After learning ticket sales were costing $1,500 each, Young decided the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had nothing to do with the spirit of rock and roll and it was just a cash grab. He refused to be inducted. At that time, CSM were dropped by Atlantic Records. In 1999, CSM came together to write the album Looking Forward. The group were now in their 50s. Stephen Stills required two hearing aids, while Neil Young at one point began recording White Line a song he'd forgotten he recorded back in 1990. Unhappy with the songs, Young instructed Nash to write a song like Our House, stating, We need it. In 2000, they embarked on a tour to support the album. This was the first CSNY tour since 1974. Before the tour could begin, Nash had to recover from a boating accident. He'd smashed into a wave which sent him flying into the air. He crashed down, breaking both his legs. It took him two hours to get back to shore. As a musician, this was one of the strangest sounds I ever heard when I broke my legs. It was a two hour journey back after the accident on the boat to port. And the way that I dealt with it was I chose to ignore everything below my waist. I went in my mind to a great sunset and my land in Hawaii with its waterfalls and, and uh, the beauty of it. And the two hours passed very quickly. During the press tour, Graham Nash appeared in a wheelchair. After it was finished, the tour had grossed them $42 million. By mid-2000, VH1 aired a documentary about CSNY for their VH1 Legends series. All members, including Young, were interviewed for the show, which documented their turbulent career documentary ends optimistic about their future. CSNY continued to tour on and off for the next two years. At one point when Crosby entered the stage, Young announced, Ladies and gentlemen, the lion from the Wizard of Oz. In 2004, Crosby was arrested for possession of a criminal weapon, ammunition and possession of marijuana. Crosby had never quit using marijuana and at this point saw it as medicinal. He received a $5,000 fine. Stills at this time was also diagnosed with prostate cancer. In 2005, Neil Young was diagnosed with a brain aneurysm. He was admitted for surgery. Following his release after surgery, Young passed out while walking down a New York street. Despite this, months later, he was back performing live. In 2006, while visiting his daughter in college, Young saw a picture of wounded soldiers on the cover of a US Today newspaper. Reminiscent of Ohio, he began writing a protest song. After he was finished, he continued writing more songs. Young had soon penned the album, Living With War. He later said, 
Some of the melodies on the songs were not good, but they got the message across. The album was released shortly afterwards. The songs were made available to download free on Young's website. Knowing the message would be heard by more people with CSNY than just Neil Young, the group sat out on a tour named the Freedom of Speech Tour. For once, financial gain wasn't their only motivation. During the tour, some fans reacted with anger towards the song and Neil Young pushing his political views. That's the worst concert I've ever been to. They, they have a right, I mean, we can't even hear these songs that they sang. They're great singers and great band. But to do this political stuff, and that's all they're here for is a political rally, that's This whole concert was great until that song got that song just now on there. They can suck my dick, son of a bitch. I'd like to knock this f***ing teeth out. That's what I'd like to do. Because he's a stupid son of a bitch. One year later, Neil Young's wife Peggy performed with him at Farm Aid. In 2008, the documentary CSNY Deja Vu was released. It documented their time on the Freedom of Speech tour. In 2012, Neil Young began promoting his portable high-res audio player Pono. He appeared on the David Letterman show of a prototype. The audio player triangular and yellow resembled a Toblerone chocolate bar. In 2014, Neil and his wife Peggy divorced after almost 40 years of marriage. Peggy died five years later from cancer. She was 66 years old. Through 2014, Young continued to promote the Pono player and began a relationship with actress Daryl Hannah. In September, Crosby is interviewed by the Idaho Statesman. When asked about Neil Young's divorce and relationship with Daryl Hannah, Crosby states, I happen to know he's hanging out with somebody that's a purely poisonous predator. Crosby later stated he'd been talking off the record. The quote destroyed his relationship with Young. Crosby lived to regret the comments and the two would never bury the hatchet. On the Howard Stern Show, when asked about a CSNY reunion, Neil Young states, That will never happen, not in a million years. Eight months after, Crosby appeared on the Howard Stern Show and publicly apologised for the comments. He told Stern he did phone Young to apologise, but Young wanted him to print a reaction, to which Crosby replied, I don't know about that. The next tour sees Nash and Crosby's relationship break down completely. And he's screaming at me in my face from about this far away, spittle hitting me in the face, and he's screaming, you don't get it, do you? You mean nothing to me now. Nothing. I hate you. Following the Christmas tree lighting incident, CSNY disband, this time for good. I wrote that for David Crosby. And basically the song is about who are you? Who are you when you're not famous? Who are you when the lights have gone out and the, and the, and the, the audience has left? Who are you? Are you a decent person? Or are you a fucking asshole? There are too many reasons. It's too complicated. It's too painful. I'm just telling you, it's over. Of course it's sad. Of course it is. Of course I'm going to miss it. Next. Would you like to talk to him? No, I'm not interested. And if he reaches out to you? He can try all he wants. It's a little fucking late. Left on his own, Crosby begins releasing solo material. In 2017, Pono goes out of business. In 2019, the brilliant documentary David Crosby, Remember My Name is released. The documentary follows a man nearing the end of his life. I'm afraid of dying. And I'm close. I don't like it. I'd like to have more time. A lot more time. He's fully aware his time's running out, as is his wife, who fears he might not even return home from his next tour. Crosby lays bare his regrets, his fears, while being opinionated as ever. Crosby's estranged relationship with Neil Young and CSNY is touched upon. 
At this point, knowing his time is finite, Crosby plans his funeral. In 2021, Crosby, Stills and Nash are interviewed for CBS This Morning. Crosby holds back when asked about his ongoing feud with Neil Young. I said bad stuff about his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Probably. Don't say it, Dave. During the interview, Graham Nash admits he, Stills and Young were still in regular contact, but neither three of them speak to Crosby. November 2022, Neil Young appears on The Howard Stern Show. When asked about Crosby, Young seems to be warming up to the idea of burying the hatchet. Young states, I hope he's doing okay. At the same time, Crosby is dying. David Crosby passed away January 18th, 2023. Graham Nash later confirmed it was due to complications from COVID. Crosby's son stated, he went to take a nap and never woke up again. With the death of David Crosby, it was the end of CSMY, this time forever. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel. If you wish to donate, it would be greatly appreciated as this is my main source of income. Just click the free symbols next to the video, then the thanks icon, and however much you wish to donate. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for my next video.